Hi, my name is Alton Sinclair, and this year I have the pleasure of presenting and demonstrating the TMEA Allstate Jazz Tenor Trombone Etudes. So a couple things that we're going to be talking about within this video is going to be what I feel is important within each of these etudes as far as style, articulation, and phrasing, as well as giving you supplemental information as far as who to listen to for certain styles. So for example, we'll be talking a lot about different players within the jazz idiom, um, many players ranging from bebop to samba to, to different styles and feels. So I'm really excited to be presenting this to you, and so let's go ahead and get straight into this. So for the first etude of this year's jazz tenor trombone music, the first etude is based off of the bebop era, and it's actually written by yours truly. The etude is based off of Charlie Parker's 1945 composition entitled Confirmation. So let's talk about the next sentence within that same bullet point. Refer to Charlie Parker's recording. I'm going to repeat that one more time. Refer to Charlie Parker's recording. It's very important to make sure that you have an inner ear model ready to reference whenever it comes to learning these types of etudes. And if you don't, then it's really important that we build a really good fundamental inner ear model. Building an inner ear model really begins with listening to the original recording for whatever tune or song you might be listening to. So let's talk about the second bullet point, playing within the bebop style and swinging the eighth notes. Well, if you've never listened to bebop music, how are you going to know how to do either of those two things? You won't. It's like somebody asking you, hey, tell me something you've never heard before. That's impossible. This is why it's very important to start building that strong inner ear model so that way we have a fundamental understanding and hearing knowledge of what bebop and bebop phrasing sounds like. Now, talking a little bit more about that second bullet point, swinging the eighth notes and playing within a bebop style is really going to come down to you listening and singing along to melodies, for example. So I would advise you to sing along to Charlie Parker's original recording of Confirmation. So now that third bullet point, phrasing is guided by the articulations written and within the style. So let's kind of talk about those two aspects of playing this etude. So I have a bunch of articulations written in that aren't the same, but also I have a bunch of articulations written in that basically phrase the exact same way, they just have different notes and different arrival points as far as resolving lines into one another. So this fourth bullet point, Playing at a faster tempo doesn't mean to rush your phrases to the last note. There is a pocket. So really this one comes out of, at least for me, out of personal excitement at maybe playing at a faster tempo than what you're used to. My last point about that is that even though you're excited, let that excitement allow you to focus more on being controlled as opposed to letting that excitement take you to places that maybe you haven't refined just yet as far as volume and technique are concerned. Now. The last sentence of that little point is, there is a pocket, and the only way you learn how to play in the pocket is by listening to the pocket and trying to sing along to the pocket. Now I'm not talking about the pocket that's in front of your pants or in front of your shorts, but the pocket that's within the music. So for this example, since we're talking about a bebop etude, it's important that you start listening to recordings from the bebop era so that way you can hear the bebop pocket by the masters. And we'll talk about who to listen to as far as trombone goes for the bebop masters and as far as great recordings to listen to just for your own enjoyment. So this next bullet point is really meant for us as trombonists. And what this bullet point says is something that has always helped me, and that's using alternate positions. But for this example, using fourth position D, the D out of the staff, right above middle C, is going to be a necessity in order for you to play lines at maybe the more up-tempo speeds. A general rule of thumb that I like to use, no matter what I'm playing, is that if there is a D between middle C and E flat, then I'm going to go ahead and utilize that fourth position D. So moving on to the next bullet point, measure 20, that last eighth note which is a C should actually extend to B4 and it should not be clipped. So a couple more bullet points about this etude. All the notes should have good tone. Just because something is marked accented as a short 
length does not mean that that note loses tone. And also, even though you're swinging at maybe a faster tempo than what you're used to, it doesn't have to be rigid or jagged. Smooth out your tongue. And that's going to require you to gauge the airspeed and the amount of air needed in order for you to play efficiently. And that brings me to my next point. Refer to the trombone greats. Because not only are they playing efficiently, but they're doing it in a way that nobody else has done it before. And now we're all trying to catch up. So, my personal favorites include the great J.J. Johnson, Curtis Fuller, Slide Hampton, Frank Rosalino, Steve Davis, and of course there's many others. Now, I do need to bring to your attention one note change. In measure 11, on the end of 3, I believe that that is shown as A sharp, and it should be a G sharp. Now we're going to listen to the recording that I've made for this A2. A2 number 2. This year's A2 number 2 is a ballad by Ed Lowe. So this second etude is based on the great J.J. Johnson's Lament. And as I said before for the etude previous, you need to refer to his recordings of Lament, or refer to the original recordings rather. So playing a ballad with the knowledge of what is okay to use as an inflection in order to create nuance. So that's a lot of stuff. Let's kind of delve in. So playing a ballad with the knowledge of what is okay to use. Let's stop right there. How do you know what's okay to use on a ballad? Well, there's not really a set rule, but there is a common way to play a ballad. And that common way can be found by listening to recordings, which is the next line. Listen to recordings. And I'll be sure to recommend some of my favorite ballad players. So, first off, let's back up a little bit. How do you gain the knowledge? Well, we kind of talked about that with the first etude, by listening. And as I said in the introduction to this video, there's going to be a lot of listening that I'm going to be talking about. So make sure you either write down or you save some of these PowerPoint bullets so that way you can go and check out these recordings because not only are they great, but it is imperative that you as a listener and student understand what we are talking about as far as referencing other great players. So let's talk about the third bullet point, which really starts getting into the style that many people know how to play ballads in. So a couple questions that I have is, when is vibrato appropriate? What kind of vibrato works within certain registers? How does articulation help with phrasing within ballad playing? Articulation? I thought everything was smooth. Well, everything can be smooth, but sometimes using different styles of articulation, whether it be a short articulation, then a longer articulation, can also exaggerate a phrase. And I'll show you a little bit of that within the recording that I made for this etude as well. So, remember, not everything has to be long. Although a ballad is normally longer articulation, there is a little bit of leeway whenever it becomes a question of phrasing and making those phrases speak out a little bit more than others in order to create contrast, which at the end of the day is really important within music. So, let's get into that next word, inflection. What is inflection? Well, inflection and nuance are kind of two of the same words. What's nuance? Well, there's different things that create nuance, but really what nuance and inflection fall under is the way to play a note. So whether that be maybe more aggressive, maybe more timid, maybe a little bit more forward articulated, maybe longer in length, maybe with a different tone, maybe with a different stylized tone. These are all different things that you can gain by listening to different players. Really, it's all about gaining 
those big ears in order for you to gauge how to play these etudes at a higher quality. So I'm sure we've all heard the saying, sometimes too much of a good thing can be a bad thing. And so sometimes too much of a certain inflection can become either over-exaggerated, overused, or to be quite frank, just too much. Now, it's really important that you listen to different players so that you can build and expand your bag of inflections that you have ready to go. I think it's very important that we as players make sure that we establish that we can play our instrument before adding different things. I know as a judge, I like to hear somebody play their instrument at a very high level before evaluating potentially different styles that they can play. Number one, your tone is the most important thing. Every time anybody hears somebody play, the first thing that they hear is their tone. The same thing with how you listen to people talk. For example, you always know how your parents are going to start talking to you depending on the tone of their voice. So, keep that in mind whenever you begin to play or audition for the panel of judges. And it's not that you have to have a timid tone either. You can have a really nice core, but you don't have to be the loudest person in the room, and you don't have to scoop into every note, or you don't have to fall off of every note, or you don't have to begin every note with vibrato, or end every note with vibrato. Now, yes, that is a lot of options that I just listed, but the best way to find out how to really phrase a ballad is by listening to some of the best ballad players. And some of those players are going to be completely different from one another, but that's okay, because that's going to inform you of what you like as a listener and as a player. Now, let's talk about the very last point. Vibrato is only effective whenever you are playing in tune. Not within tune with a metronome, or not within tune within yourself or like a vibe, but in tune with a tuner. Too much vibrato can be a bad thing because sometimes people might think that you're overshadowing a potentially out of tune note. So, as I stated before, the first thing that people hear you play is your tone. And you got to make sure that your tone is centered and you got to make sure that you as a player are in tune. Now, how do you know whenever enough is enough or what's too much or what's not enough? Well, that takes a lot of time, but the best recommendation I have for you for throughout this entire video is going to be to listen to numerous sources. Now, before I play for you both the all region cut and all state cut, I want to give you a couple of people to listen to. Bill Watrous, J.J. Johnson, Vic Dickinson, Irby Green, Tommy Dorsey, and of course there are many others. You can also include Slide Hampton, Curtis Fuller, Frank Rosalino, Steve Davis, and of course many other modern day trombonists that are putting out music today. <laughs> Etude number three this year is an easy samba written by Bob Burnham. And like the other two etudes, I've also played and recorded a version of this for you all to listen at the end of my points. So let's talk about some of these bullet points. So remember in order to play faster and in the upper register, you must relax. But in order to relax, you must understand the process needed to play in the upper register and at a faster tempo. 
So let's delve into that. Whenever you play in the upper register, it's not really about how much air you have, it's about how fast the air that you have is moving. Now that doesn't mean that you take shallow breaths, but that also doesn't mean that you take grand all breaths either. You just have to have a good amount of air in order to move faster, since whenever you play in the upper register, you have to think about a thinner stream of air moving at a higher rate than usual. In order to practice that, I would recommend a couple things. First off, being able to buzz what we call sirens or firefighter sirens, whatever you want to call them. I know whenever I was first learning about them, we called them sirens because they sounded like the fire truck sirens. So I would practice that going from low to high, as well as learning how to play your scales and thirds, but in two octaves while trying to keep the same setup and without too much shifting going on within your embouchure. Now it's natural for you to maybe firm up your corners more, but that doesn't mean allow tension to get in there. What that means is you're creating a smaller space so that way you can move faster air since it's going to be thinner as opposed to playing maybe in the mid or lower register. Now let's talk about the next point. Playing a samba means two things. First off, since this is an easy samba, we're not going to be playing as heavy, so we're going to be playing lightly and in a more even eighth note feel. But as I said earlier, for the, for the first etude, in every style there is a pocket and you should always be in it. And once again, how do you know whenever you're playing in the pocket? Well, you have to first learn what the pocket sounds like and you have to be able to sing along with the pocket. So that means you're going to listen to more players, as I've been talking about throughout this entire presentation. So let's talk about a couple things specific to this etude. First off, playing loudly in the upper register is not going to guarantee that the notes will be coming out even or that they're going to be suitable for the lines. Make sure that you pay attention to your lines and volume. The more even you play, the easier this etude will be. Now that doesn't mean use poor dynamics, but what that does mean is have a suitable range for forte to mezzo forte to piano. So something specific about this exact etude is that this is a very long etude with some difficult partial leaps and a couple of partials that are very close together. Not only are partial leaps hard, but having partials that are close together, in my opinion, is even harder because you can hear the note, but sometimes you'll just play the wrong partial unless you can practice this to where you can't get it wrong. Now, let's kind of talk about what I just said. Practicing till you can't get it wrong. That means that you have muscle memory. So muscle memory, at least for brass players, is a good thing because it helps us remember where our buzz is and how it feels within the mouthpiece and how it feels within the horn whenever it resonates back to us. So if you've ever held your horn and you're playing perfectly in tune, your whole horn resonates because the air is flowing at the perfect speed and you have the perfect amount of air and you're playing in tune. So because this is a long etude, you're going to want to make sure that you're playing efficiently. And that means that whenever you play efficiently, you're considering everything from dynamics to air to chops to possible fatigue and many other aspects that can play into playing efficiently. But whenever you play efficiently, that also means that you have enough muscle memory for you to remember what it feels like in order to play correctly. And so the best way to build muscle memory is by practicing slow, then fast, not medium fast, and then faster. So remember, the slower you go, the better and easier it's going to be whenever you play at a faster tempo. And as I say for the very last word of this bullet point, metronome. Articulations are written in the music in order to help with phrasing. Once again, short doesn't mean clipped and long doesn't mean sloppy. Just because they're written that way doesn't mean that you get to sacrifice the tone. Make sure that you address each articulation with an intentful way of playing. And as far as trombone is concerned, move your slide in time. And the best way to do that is by going through exercises such as Play, stop, play, stop, play, stop, play, stop. So, here are some of my listening recommendations. And actually, t these recommendations aren't even trombonist. One is a tenor saxophone player, and then one of them is a jazz euphonium player. Any person that you listen to can inform you of the best way to approach a style. And in my opinion, these two players personify this easy samba style. 
especially with these three recordings that I'm going to be recommending to you, which is St. Thomas by both Sonny Rollins and Rich Madison on separate recordings, and Rich Madison on Bye Bye Blues. As we've been noticing, we're doing a lot of listening. Up next is the all-region and all-state improvisation etudes. For now, here is my recording of etude number three. Let's first start off with the F Blues, since everybody who auditions will have to play the all-region jazz improvisation etude. So let's discuss some of the qualities of a blues that I think are very important. First, whenever we're talking about a blues, we're talking about a 12-bar song or tune form. It's important that we establish how long the form is because then that tells us how to potentially organize a solo that makes sense and is coherent all while informing us how long a chorus might be on this particular form. So this year's etude for the audition is two choruses with a four bar intro. So that means we have a total of 28 bars to play, but that doesn't mean that we have to take up all 28 bars. So after this brief talking period, I will be demonstrating three different solos that I played over the all region jazz improv etude. These three different solos, I would like to point out, demonstrate three different qualities and three different styles that you can play over a blues, such as playing within the blues style with multiple types of blues vocabulary, such as minor thirds, the flat sevenths of course, and many other riff-based types of improvisations. The second solo that I play is a little bit more indicative of both bebop and those blues inflections. Now this, to me is something that's very important because playing bebop is a huge part of jazz. As many people, I would say, and I believe many of my mentors would say, come out of the bebop era as far as learning jazz and learning how to improvise with that bebop vocabulary, along with being informed by the blues inflection. For the third demonstration that I play over this improv etude, I try to demonstrate a couple of things both with blues inflection, bebop vocabulary, as well as some different harmonic choices such as different root motions. We won't get into that right now as far as a complete description, but I would like to point out in my second chorus, I start thinking about that root motion and because of that, the pattern that I play actually implies the root motion of F7 or F dominant 7 to E flat 7 which is a whole step down to D flat 7 which is another whole step to B7, which is a half step away to B flat, which resolves very nicely as far as chromaticism and tension to release. So be sure to check out that pattern that I play. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about where I got all this vocabulary from. Notice the word vocabulary. Much like speaking in any language, you learn how to use words within their context. This also applies to jazz improvisation. So, I'd like to point out a couple of the pieces of vocabulary that I used throughout each of those examples that I've played for you. So be sure to check that out whenever you're listening. Lastly, it's important, and I know that I've covered this already throughout the entirety of this video, but you need to listen. And I'll have a couple of examples that I feel that you should, as a listener and as a student, check out and attempt to transcribe. But it's very important that you gather vocabulary for a language that you might not know as much about, at least not know much about yet. So be sure to listen to some great players such as the masters of this music and be sure to steal as much as you can from the masters that you listen to. Oh. 
jazz improvisation etude is based on a jazz standard titled Autumn Leaves. Now a couple of things to notice is that number one this is a faster etude than the all region improv etude. Number two there's a couple of more key centers such as B flat and G minor along with the occasional E flat major. Now let's talk about the ways that they're getting to B flat G minor and E flat. There's this progression that's one of the most popular progressions in the world called the 251 or perfect authentic cadence, but at least in the jazz realm we refer to this as a 251 because we're talking about the root motion, something that I mentioned earlier. So, as a quick example, in B flat, the 2 would be C because that is the second scale degree, the 5 would be F since that's the fifth scale degree, and the 1 would be B flat since that's tonic, right? Or the home key. Same thing for G minor and of course E flat later on. So a couple things I would like you to notice is my use of certain isms such as inflections within the choruses. Also this is a longer etude because you have two choruses but each chorus is 32 bars and if I'm not mistaken there's a 8 bar extension for the second chorus along with a 4 bar intro similar to the first region improv etude. So we have a lot of time to make some great music and of course play a great solo. So this means you need to be organized with maybe the way that you want to approach the first course or maybe even the first half. Now that we have all this time, we can now build another clear and cohesive solo full of knowledge, intent, nuance, and of course inflection and our own personal likings. In my two examples that I present to you over this particular Allstate Etude, I really try to make sure that I space myself out as far as the amount of notes that I play and the way that I resolve. I also play a couple of notes that are outside of the harmony written, but that's towards the end of my solo because you really don't want to start out with something that might be a little too dissonant for somebody's ear on the other side. So please make sure that you notice some of the ways that I approach each section from a harmonic standpoint, from the amount of notes, from the inflection 
to the way that I also end my phrases. And I'd also like to note, just because we're at a faster tempo does not mean that we get to tense up and take away tone from endings of phrases or notes for that matter. Now, I'm not saying that you can't articulate a note a little bit harder than another, but I am saying make sure that you have a consistency of good tone. That is the utmost importance whenever you're soloing or really playing your instrument at any point in time, is to have an excellent tone. It's like trying to listen to somebody, but they have a very muffled sound whenever talking, and that can get annoying. Lastly, as I've said for each of these etudes and the previous improv etude, you have to listen to the greats play over these tunes, and you have to steal, steal, steal as much as you can in order to start speaking the language. Once again, this is a language. This is something that takes a long time to understand. But whenever you start learning words, then you start understanding how to put more words together and so on. Same thing with improvisation. Improvisation really should not be learning based off of scales. It should be more about using the things that you can hear in context. So that's why I say to transcribe somebody playing on Autumn Leaves. Or you can also use this recording, but I would highly suggest you checking out the supplemental instruction that I have attached at the end of this. So, have a great time, make sure you practice, and just because it's fast, once again, doesn't mean you have to tense up. Now that we're getting to the end of the video, I just want to say thank you so much for allowing me to make this video for you all. I hope you found this helpful as far as finding out what to play within a style, how to play within a style, and who else to check out, as well as demonstrating the actual etudes for you this year. I will say this, you can never do enough listening, especially whenever we're starting to get into the jazz idiom. So, 
Be sure to listen, and if you have any more questions, my contact information will be at the end of this video. And my very last piece of advice is three words, and these are three words that I live by, and I believe many others live by as far as who's successful out there. And it's having intention, consistency, and awareness. These three things I find are some of the most helpful words whenever I might be trying to figure out what I want to do within the music or you know any other activity I might be doing. So once again, intention, consistency, awareness. And by the way, you cannot have one without the other. So with that being said, good luck practicing and make sure that you practice to where you're having fun and that you're enjoying it.